Mildred Muhammad is a survivor of domestic violence. You may not recognize her name, but you might be familiar with a story from back in 2002 of a man referred to as the D.C. sniper. That man, John Allen Muhammad, was Mildred's former husband. He and a teen accomplice shot and killed 10 people in a three-week killing spree in the Washington, D.C. area. What was later revealed was that the main target was actually Mildred, and the shooting spree was part of an elaborate scheme to make it look like she was the victim of a crazed sniper. Mildred endured years of domestic violence before breaking free from her marriage. She was invited to Rochester this week by the Willow Center for Domestic Violence to share her story of survival. Here's my interview with author and advocate Mildred Muhammad and president and CEO of the Willow Domestic Violence Center, Jamie Saunders. Mildred, many people watching right now remember, if vaguely, the story of the man who would become known as the DC sniper. Uh, what they don't know are the stories of the lives that were lost in that tragedy in 2002. And they also don't know, many likely don't know, the full story of the person who was to be the main target, and that was you. And I, I want to know, at what point did you say, I need to share my story, the full story, what, what people don't realize, and, and why was that important for you to do that? Well, there was an advocate in Prince George's County, and she pulled together a survivors, for, for survivors Forum for survivors to tell their story. And she contacted me because she wanted to show that domestic violence doesn't have a religion. So it was a Christian woman, a Muslim woman, and a Jewish woman. And at the end of my presentation, I got a standing ovation. I thought I would be not very well received because the community blamed me. They said if I would have stayed with John and he just would have killed me, how dare I bring this drama into this quiet community? If I would have stayed on the West Coast, then the people on the East Coast would still be alive. So it was very important for me to begin to share my story so that other people could be helped. You were married for 12 years right. to, to John Muhammad, the convicted and now executed DC sniper. I read an interview and you said this, for years you knew that your ex-husband wanted to kill you, but no one would listen. Mm -hmm. And I think for some it's mind boggling to think that you would take that risk and open yourself up and share what you were going through with someone and they, they wouldn't believe you. Why did they not? Because John was charismatic. He was very well liked. No one wanted to believe that that was another side of him, and they didn't know me very well. So he also told them that I was very emotional, not to believe anything that she says. So he poisoned the well where I could not get help. He even said that if you tell anybody, I'm gonna fix it to where no one will believe what you're saying anyway. And that's exactly what he did. So in your memoir, and we have that here right now, Scared Silent, when the one you love becomes the one you fear, you talk about how you experienced emotional and mental and financial abuse. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't understand, because we think so often that domestic violence, there, you have to bear physical scars, right? right? And you have to see it. For those who don't understand what that looks like, the, the emotional and the mental and the financial, how would you explain that to them? Well, 80 percent of victims don't have physical scars. So when I'm expressing to you, well, John is not, he's, he's, he's verbally assaulting me, he's making me feel like I'm worth nothing. He makes me, he doesn't give me but $50 a month to buy food for three children, myself and my mother. I'm trying to understand what he's thinking. I need to be ready for him when he comes home so that I don't tr trigger something where he's gonna backlash on me. When you tell that to people, they say, well, why don't you just suck it up? He's not hitting you, right? At least he's coming home with the money. He's, he's buying you something. So what, what's the problem? The difference is there's domestic abuse and there's domestic violence. The first assault to domestic abuse is a verbal assault. It's what I say to you and it's, it's how you interpret what I say. The assault comes nine seconds later when there's a physical altercation and now I'm in shock because you hit me now I don't want to tell anybody because I feel guilty, I feel ashamed, and I feel stupid. Because if I come to you and tell you that you're going to say, girl, just go home. It's going to be all right. Just pray about it and everything will be fine. It's not going to be fine. And what we end up doing is the 
touch test. Touch test is I come to you and say, John is not treating me well and I just I just don't know what to do and I'm just I'm at my wits end and you say, John wouldn't do anything like that. I will never speak to you again. You just sent me back and now I have nowhere to go. Well, the Willow Domestic Violence Center, formerly known mm -hmm. as Alternatives for Battered Women, released a community report in the fall that found reports of domestic violence in Monroe County are above state rates. And, and you said this, this is not race-based, it's not economic-based. Mm -hmm. This is happening in all zip codes. 51% of domestic violence reports come from Monroe County suburbs uh, and 49% from the city of Rochester. Mm -hmm. and, and Jamie, how would you define domestic violence, what does that term mean? Because sometimes I think we don't really have a thorough understanding of all that's involved. That's exactly right. Well, I just must say that we are so inspired by stories like Mildred and for Mildred to come forward uh, that brings the, the sensationalism. You can't even imagine with a DC sniper and how many lives were impacted. But it does not have to be physical abuse, which I think is such a, a critical message to get forward. Everyone deserves the right to a safe and healthy relationship. That's the point. And anything less than that is unacceptable. So domestic abuse is power and control of one person over another. And it can be physical, it can be verbal, it can be spiritual, it can be financial, it can be sexual abuse. It's a whole range. But the, the core of it is a power and control of one person over another. And we see that from our young people. We have seen an increase since our name change of those that are reaching out to us from 11 to 15 years old, our young people who are dating, who learn from the TV, they learn from well, the media, they learn from social media as well that the drama is supposed to be how we show love. I have a little daughter and she came home and said that a little you know, boy had hit her on the playground and she was told because he likes her. We have to stop it right there. That is not what we need to teach our young people. We need to emphasize that healthy relationships is a right and anything less is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And because Mildred bore no physical scars or bruises, people just didn't believe that you were a victim. And I would have to imagine that there are several other myths that mm -hmm. must be debunked when it comes to this. What are some of those myths? Well, I, the, the suburban uh, myth, right? Mm -hmm. So this is in every single zip code in Monroe County. Mm -hmm. At Willow Center, 7,000 people reach out to us every single year. That's more than 2,000 in our court program where we help them with orders of protection. And that half of those are from the suburbs. We see that at our hotline, which responds to more than 5,000 calls every year. That's a neighbor who's concerned about an, uh, uh, what they hear out in the, in the driveway. It could be a little boy who called from the closet because his parents were fighting. It is the person who is triggered by something on television that they just saw or they don't know what they have. At Willow Center, and, and it breaks my heart to hear of Mildred's story, uh, she's resilient, she is strong and sturdy, and she <laughs> took care of it. Uh, and she found herself in a, in a shelter that was not like Willow, and that we have other domestic violence survivors. We are, that's what we do, and we will help on safety planning. We are there not to judge. Uh, only the survivor knows when it's safe for them to leave. Mm -hmm. And it's not always safe to leave. And Mildred has a, in her, other books that she has about safety planning, mm -hmm. uh, there's multiple steps and it's not always um, uh, that moment. There's complications of financial control, mm -hmm. kids. Uh, we had a woman uh, at Willow who pointedly said she was going to wait till her child turned 18 because she wouldn't leave. She had to be there to protect her child. She mm -hmm. had to wait five years. But to her, that was the most logical thing and it made sense. Mildred, you you left. You were able to do that. And, how, that, and you were talking about, you said that it, that's a difficult step that's for people tough. to take. How do you, I, I guess, how difficult is it? Because some people don't get it. And you said this. You said people said to you, you know, just deal with it or this mm -hmm. or that. You, I'm sure you hear so many comments from people and thoughts would go through one's head um, as to why, why to stay. How do you, you know, make that one step? Strategically because you have to tell one trusted friend, key word is trusted, that you're trying to leave your relationship. And you only tell one because you don't know the reach of the abuser. You don't know who your abuser knows. He's not gonna bring you every person that he knows and say this is this person, this is that person. So one trusted friend. And the way that, that I left it was after he kidnapped the children, he had them on a weekend visitation and I was only eating crushed ice and a half a slice of bread. I felt that if they're not eating, 
then I can't eat. If they're not sleeping, then I'm not sleeping. People around me knew where my children were and didn't tell me. He took them out of the country for 18 months. So I was signing for a package for my mother, passed out, went to the hospital. My mother called the hospital and said that John was on his way to kill me. That's when they put me, took me out of the room and that's when I went to a shelter. But in, upon going to the shelter, I had to change my name, I had to change my clothes, and I had to disconnect from everybody that I knew. They had to put me in complete seclusion. No one could know where I was. When I hear this, it makes me think of there's the, the nationwide campaign, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. and, and that's directed to terrorism and right. terrorism-related crimes. But is there a possibility that that's also connected to domestic violence? I, I think so often we, someone could suspect, I could suspect something, but by not saying something to mm -hmm. the, the, the husband, the wife, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the partner, what can that potentially do? Is there a ripple effect? Well, it's easier to go to the victim and say, why you let him hit you? But when the abuser come in the room, you leave. So it's easy to confront the victim, but it's difficult for you to confront the abuser. So if we're gonna tell victims to stop being victimized, then we have to tell abusers to stop abusing, because you can't have one without the other. So it's difficult for, you, for me to say something, to see something, because can, you can see me in a dialogue and you say, you know what, I'm gonna intervene. Check your boundaries, because you don't wanna intervene and you end up getting hurt or you end up being killed, right? And then you're feeling, well, I shouldn't have stepped in anyway. That's why you have a cell phone with a camera. Call the police, they're trained. Let them know there's a situation here, we're in the mall, we're at the store, he looks like he's combative, I, I fear for the safety of the woman that I'm seeing. Take a picture, send it to the police, let them know this is the car, don't follow, just observe and wait for the police to come and point out to where they are. That's what you can do in a safe place for yourself because everybody has a phone, everybody has a camera, use it. We call that upstanders. Okay. So no longer being a bystander, but actually setting the tone in the culture that it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So we also have to recognize while we might want to intervene, as Mildred pointed out, it can't, it's not always safe for the victim or the survivor to mm -hmm. confront when the abuser is there or to directly confront the abuser mm -hmm. because then they can go behind a closed door and take it out on the victim. Right. So it's important that we really let that survivor drive the bus. They're the ones that know when it's safe. Mm -hmm. The front lines, yes, Willow Center, our team, I'm just so proud of what our team makes happen every single day. But the frontline staff are really the friends, the neighbors, the coworkers. Mm -hmm. And it's for us to say when that survivor is alone, I'm here for you, I'm mm -hmm. worried about you, you can trust me, mm -hmm. and just so that they know they have a place to go. Imagine feeling so isolated, so alone, it makes it all that more difficult. So as we as a community come to support survivors, they will take that step when it's ready and the right time for them. Mm -hmm. Why do abusers abuse? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a question that I, I, I think a lot of people just can't quite understand. Right. What, what, what drives someone to do something like that? I'll tell you science and then you can tell okay. what you see. <laughs> okay. uh, we know that domestic violence, dating and domestic violence is learned. We know it's learned, and therefore we know it goes from one generation to the next. So if you grow up in a house of domestic violence, the, it increases your chance, your likelihood to either be a victim or a perpetrator. But you can also do that third path, which you break that cycle, which mm -hmm. is incredible stories of resilience that we see. Mm -hmm. But it is learned. It is power and control of one person over another. Mm -hmm. And we speak about uh, you know, more heterosexual relationships, men and women, but it can go the other way as well in same-sex relationships. And at Willow Center, it's a big part of why we changed our name from Alternatives for Battered Women. It's not all physical, battered, as we just discussed, and it impacts a whole range of relationships. So we need to make sure that we're there for all of those, but the complexity, that's a million dollar question mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the whys, but we need to start asking not why does she stay, but why does that abuse. person hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I've noticed is that it's the, the frustrations and the disappointments that the abuser goes through instead of him or her accepting responsibility for their own lives, then it's because of you. If you wouldn't have done this, if you wouldn't have done that, if you would have had the food cooked on time, if you would have had the children 
cleaned and ready. If, if you would have had my beer ready, if you, if you, if you. So they take no responsibility for their actions and they actually feel that they're justified in how they articulate or respond to you. So that's, and some of them are envious that she has more education than I do. Now you're having affairs, all made up in the mind, but just another reason to control and to make sure that she doesn't go anywhere. And, you know, I love you and I'll love you to death. Okay, that's a flag because I don't want anybody to love me to death. I, ne I need to leave and I need to be strategic. Vice President Joe Biden has called domestic violence a public health epidemic. Yes. Why do you think he calls it that? It's about time. One in three women and one in four men will be a victim of domestic violence in his or her lifetime. And yet we know the length, the level, the severity, the stalking, the homicides yeah. disproportionately impact women. But we have something happening when the majority of us, or that you can tell, that you, you look at a room and one in three, one in four, we all know someone, they may not share it with you, but we all know someone who's been impacted by domestic violence. It is so critical that we talk about it and having the vice president, having the Center for Disease Control declare it a public health epidemic is a good thing. Because the more that we shine the light on it, it is the more that we can expose it and the, the more that we have an opportunity to end it. That's the critical step for us throughout this process. And while we talk about uh, domestic violence and abuse doesn't have to be physical, the mere threat, the verbal threats actually change the body. It does have a physical impact. So mm -hmm. there's been studies on that. In our shelter at, at Willow, our children had, were, had incredible amounts of PTSD when they were diagnosed. The trauma that they've seen and that they've witnessed so what keeps me up at night is how do I break that cycle? How do these children in their future, while mom is healing, parent is healing, that these children are also being impacted? And that was not talked about before. So we have this opportunity as a community to make sure that we're there to surround and support the survivors. At Willow, we serve, as I mentioned, 7,000 a year through all the various programming. And last year, we had 1,600 who called us, and we were full in our shelter. The demand right here in Monroe County is high, and we need to be there to expand our services so that we're able to su support every single survivor who steps forward when they do. Also, it's a, it's a public health issue because it has gone into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Domestic violence affects health care. Women are not showing up for work. Productivity is down. Right. Workplace violence, the abuser comes to the office. He not only kills the, uh, the victim, but he kills other people as well. Right. So it's, it's an epidemic. We all know someone who is or was a victim of domestic violence, and we don't always know what to do to help them. So we just stand back and we don't want to get involved because we don't want to get hurt. That's public. We don't know what to do about that. That's right. Just in Kansas, two of the two weeks ago, the shooting in the workplace, and the story was covered in the amount of, uh, that he had walked in and had opened fire. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the day that he was served an order of protection from his girlfriend. So it, it, we have to also be aware as we read the stories, and it's so wonderful on, on this station, you really delve deep to mm -hmm. look beyond the headlines, which is really important so we can know the more complete story. Mildred and Jamie, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for having us. If you're a victim of domestic violence or know someone who is, call the Willow Domestic Violence Center at 585-222-SAFE.